We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good afternoon. Welcome uh, everybody who watches us uh, here in Katowice and those who watch us online. Um, well, uh, my name is Małgorzata Bonikowska. I represent the Center for International Relations from Warsaw, Poland. Um, and one of the topics of this panel is relevant to our uh, work. We, uh, uh, we fight disinformation. It has been a while we deal with this subject and it will be one of the topics covered today. But actually, the topic is uh, larger. We will be uh, focusing on new technologies generally, especially these newest technologies like AI, uh, big data, all the solutions based on these, um, these phenomena. And we would like to think about how, how we can use it smartly, how we can use it in order to, from one side, use them well and benefit of having them actually. Um, and then in the same time, not to be harmed by using the new technologies. And uh, the guests to this panel are, I hope, the people who help us to really understand where is the balance between the two. Because of course, one thing is certain, we will uh, implement new technologies, we will use new technologies. It's just a question is where this line lies in order not to not to be taken by new technologies not to be dominated by new technologies by but dominate them so let me introduce um, our speakers today let me start with our guest from lithuania dalia bankowskaite hello dalia it's nice to have you here in katowice in poland uh, dalia is uh, is uh, dealing with the disinformation phenomenon has been a while some years she does it in practice, but also she teaches at the university how to fight this information at Vilnius University, but she's also involved with Swedish Defense University. And she works for several think tanks for us in Warsaw, but also for Center for European Policy uh, Analysis in uh, Washington. Uh, of course, uh, our main topic is pro Kremlin propaganda and the information war we seem to live in already. Thank you, Dalia, for being with us. Uh, and then let me introduce, since from, starting from my right side, is Dobromir Czaj. Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. Hello, Dobromir is uh, our guest uh, from Poland. He uh, comes from the business sector. He represents the uh, technology company Edge, who has really tools, uh, algorithms, who can be used very smartly in order to fight disinformation and not only all the narratives who can lead us or mislead us. Uh, then we have with us Jarosław Pacewicz. Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. Very good morning. Very good day. Very good day. Uh, Jarosław represents a Siemens company. I don't need to introduce Siemens to you. One of really uh, the oldest uh, technological companies uh, in industry. And uh, uh, Jarosław is rep uh, responsible for, let me quote, digitalization and product and solution security. Um, that's his domain. Uh, so I hope you will help us to understand what such huge companies like Siemens can do to, from one side, uh, give the clients what they want, the public sector clients, and from the other side, protect them as well. And uh, finally, Edward Strasser. Hello, Edward. Edward uh, came to us from Vienna, from Austria, despite the tough, rigid measures taken in Vienna against traveling. So we are happy that you made it. Uh, he escaped yes, <laughs> to Poland. Uh, Edward is a CEO and co-founder of the Innovation and Politics Institute in Vienna. So he represents this uh, well, political angle um, uh, he's personally interested in political scene, but also as an institute, uh, they uh, try to develop um, so-called Demtech solutions, which is actually technology implemented in service of democracy. And the topic of the panel is exactly about that. Uh, it's not only about uh, 
new solutions like like AI uh, or big big tech in public sector, but it's also about you know if this is a challenge, if this is really a challenge, how to respond to this challenge, especially during time like pandemic. That's what we want to discuss. Uh, uh, first of all, because that's the time we are still in, and it makes us reflect on many, many things, also on new technologies. So let me start with Dahlia, maybe, because uh, that's the topic of the of the panel. We use this uh, this uh, phrase, this notion, disinformation, as one of the challenges we think are really the most important. Uh, if so, uh, Dahlia, can you help us uh, to understand what is really disinformation? Uh, it's an old thing, and at the same time as information. First of all, what is information? Information is everything, and it's extremely, extremely useful thing, but at the same time, extremely dangerous thing or very sharp thing if it is mishandled, misused. So when we talk about misinformation, it's just mistakes. You make a mistake because you didn't know, you were in a hurry, and you correct that mistake. Let's so misinformation is when we forward something we found in the internet, but we don't know. Even Always if say something. I might make some misinformation because I make a mistake just not being aware. While we talk about disinformation, it's already a very intentional misuse of information with the purpose to get benefit, to channel, to manipulate you into certain behavior. Uh, to get a certain uh, certain uh, certain profit. And from your perspective, because you are very much into this subject, has been a while, several years. Do you think we did right thing to stress that that's one of the challenges, which is really one of the most important today? I th it's it will it is very topical and it will be extremely topical, especially when we are developing so fast and and when we are moving into the digital world and everything is digitalized digitalized. digitalized. Uh, so this penetration of information and the means of persuasion and speed and the, the demand to react to that immediately uh, becomes so everyday life. That's our environment. So disinformation will remain for the rest of uh, our lives with the technology making it even more powerful. So actually, you know, our assumption is that the disinformation as a phenomenon uh, maybe it has been, you know, since the beginning of uh, human civilizations, since the, Bible has been. since the Bible, maybe. But the, the problem we face is that we never had such technologies, so sophisticated technologies, and we never had Internet, which is a global net, to be able to spread out these uh, pieces of information, the pieces of disinformation so fast and everywhere. And uh, I would like to ask Yaroslav now, if you can, from the technological point of view, also help us to understand how we should see the speed of the technology itself, you know? And uh, let's take Siemens. Siemens is one of the oldest um, companies. It's, if I am not wrong, 150 years almost. old. Yes, almost. So it's an old company, which itself had to go through a lot of changes internally. But you observe this phenomenon of the speed of technology that pushes also you to change and you you have to also think about you know how to protect yourself and how to protect your clients how would you describe this phenomenon the phenomenon of the technology growing well i'm not too old i mean not 150 years but um, thanks god you personally not but it will be feasible <laughs> technology I, I, is able to make us live over 150 indeed, years indeed i mean long new valhalla a couple of days ago i've read some expression that I really like, that the new technologies means new perspective. So day by day, we are facing with the completely new challenges. And that's why I think that, for example, from the cybersecurity point of view, what Siemens is doing, trying to secure the critical infrastructure, I mean, the water supply, energy supply, that kind of the things, uh, we are trying to, uh, on one hand, internally, but also supporting our customers. We want to always pass the message that anything what we do, is it cannot be a one-time task. So we cannot say that, hey, let's today try to protect our computer infrastructure and that's it. Let's forget it. No, 
this is the continuous, always continuous process. So there is no, uh, let's say, vacation from, from this kind of the stuff. We have always think, analyze, verify, then implement some measures to protect our environment, then optimize or, I don't know, um, modify, review, and the circle is going back and forth. So if I understand it correctly, it's just like a vision of uh, technology going absolutely everywhere even to those domains who are by you know nature quite old like energy you know uh, production it has been you know many years we have to think about production of energy i think that the big challenge for today is that even 20 years ago every single industry or the public services were growing somehow itself with the very rare links so sectors by sector by sector Indeed. now everything is interconnected right now you're fully right everything it's connected even the shop floor in the factories are connected to the internet which means there is a new huge risks for for critical infrastructure for i don't know the medicare whatever so we have two dangers already mentioned one is this information of, as a phenomenon because there is more and more pieces of information and among these pieces there could be many more pieces of disinformation and it's more and more difficult to recognize them and the second is what you mentioned Yaroslav, that actually so many sectors are interconnected because everyone is connected to the internet human beings as well so i want to pass to edward now edward uh, if you can just comment on the nature of uh these two phenomena actually for our democratic systems because this is also one of the challenges we in the west face it's not only the technology separated it's technology with people and people make democracy because you cannot visualize democratic uh, countries without people who vote who you know have some point of view who discuss so how do you see uh, this development where where are we right now as far as connection of these two before I go into this, let me ask one question. This text over here, is this written by an AI or is it an actual human interface doing this? That's perfect, because what we are seeing is actually a written form of our discussion. So we can see that the technology, with I think, started to be searched 30 years ago or 20 years ago. Now it just happens that it's just so perfect that whatever we say, it will be visible in form of the so text. So there's no person somewhere sitting and typing this in. It's algorithms. So I can blame the AI for what I'm going to say. Okay, thanks. Um, and it well, could be misunderstandings here because it's maybe not as perfect as we want to. So it's, mind it's what you're saying. Thing. It's a great thing. Mind what um, you're saying. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, just to give you an example, um, what, what's happening, especially during the last two years in the pandemic. Before that, it was... Um, strange for many people in this in, in the political world for instance to use technologies to in, in um, to bring citizens into the uh, decision making processes i mean a couple of years ago excel le maire in in france introduced this initiative to uh, co-write a bill with, with all uh, citizens of france and 23000 citizens wrote together a bill in some kind of online Wikipedia page that was five years ago. And today, after the pandemic, when people had to stay at home and politicians try to bring more citizens into um, democratic processes, these democracy technologies have become kind of mainstream. Cities are doing participatory budgeting online. Parties are doing elections and ballots online and um, institutions and regions are doing some kind of deliberation things online and so on and they all use different types of technologies with different providers and well that's basically a good thing because democracy is getting stronger with that but on the other hand today they're using technologies nobody knows from companies <laughs> nobody has heard of ever uh, technologies that are in some cases not even tested yet and this is also a kind of a bit of a threat because there is no industry standards no quality standards yet to be to be developed so i would say the positive thing is that we have a real real um, rise in using technologies for strengthening democracy especially since the, the beginning of the pandemic and on the other hand well um, many in the political sphere do not know yet what they're actually using there. 
And maybe one more challenge is that, you know, if the technology is, is used by political parties, by the politicians, especially in the democratic system, uh, there is an extra danger because it could be manipulation. It could be that they don't manipulate, somebody else manipulates because it can go through the companies whom we don't know or we don't trust. So it's the whole list of questions concerning standards, concerning certificates, you know, concerning to know better with whom we work. Because you know very well that uh, the algorithms or applications even can lead you to a complete control. You can be controlled by, you know, methods you don't even expect because you don't really uh, are aware fully of that. And one more thing is that the politicians are, most of our politi political leaders are people over 40, over 50, or even older. Two presidents of the United States, Joe Biden is almost 80 years old, uh, Donald Trump is 70, I think, seven. So if we have such people, they not necessarily and not always could really understand all the dangers. Yes, please. We did um, a series of interviews with technology CEOs of, of Demtech techno um, uh, companies that provide these kind of technologies and asked them what their, their most con precious concern was. And they said, our problem is that our clients do not understand what we are doing because the political sphere has no clue what these technologies are actually about. Yes, and also we've seen that everybody remembers when uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg was uh, uh, was invited by Congress, and he was explaining to you know to the congressmen and congresswomen the nature of Facebook, and there were so many misunderstandings, and also it was visible that some of the politicians were were not really aware fully. So uh, Dobromir, the question goes to you now because you are yourself. Uh, you came from, let's say, uh, social sciences into an IT company, um, uh, and you offer solutions, you offer algorithms who could help us to fight uh, against uh, these phenomena, for example, against this information. Can you a little bit elaborate of what exactly you're offering? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll gladly share some experiences. You know, we have uh, over two years uh, working for a USD department. Uh, tracking disinformation in the region and had some experience working also in the United States for LAPD uh, during presidential elections. So basically, uh, maybe that will sound a bit disappointing, uh, as I say about some, um, some uh, experience, there is no magical AI who could solve every issue of disinformation. I mean, there are some tools, uh, there are some algorithms that um, I'll just shortly tell you um, how they how they work. What can, what can they do? But but at least there are some tools based on AI already who can fight another tools who disinform. Uh, look, I mean, right? you, you should you should always look at this as a hybrid hybrid process uh, where there is some kind of AI <clears throat> and there is also a human in the loop. When you talk about social media, you can of course have algorithms that do early detection of narratives. That's very useful. This is what we do. Uh, you have, you know, between 24 to 48 hours before a malign narrative will spread to the to the mainstream. And actually- I mean, So fast. It's, it's really, really fast. So you need to really detect narratives on the early stage before the news get written, right? In order to hijack the narrative. So this is one thing you can do based on algorithms. So it's a segmentation of different topics that people are talking about. And this is accessible actually, but the interpretation of the narrative itself and whether it's dangerous or not, this is, this is not something that AI will, will actually help you to find out. And the second element of the, of the uh, AI system, as we can say, is actually finding um, uh, finding uh, bots and trolls. You can find some elements that are not, not natural for the traffic and obviously connected with some fake accounts or amplified traffic. And this is actually the, the essence of this information now. Of course, we can tell a lot about narratives, about fake news and so on, but uh, actually building up the reach of the fake news or, or amplifying some, some elements of the narratives, this is something uh, that really builds, um, uh, I, I think, some some tensions and um, and spreading really uh, a bad um, uh, and and as as a, as a sort of 
related to some 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 bandit and intentions as, and as i hmm? if i just may interrupt just to stress that when we say this information it can be now in any domain in any sector as far as the topic is concerned for example now pandemic itself um you know increased number of disinformation uh, narratives in the internet and in the social media such as anti-vaccine such as uh, you know many theories of so there is really every single domain people are active that this information can can uh, can be born and if you can just explain to us precisely you know how can we really um using such tools based on ai like there are many companies like yours who are trying to fit into it so we are one step further because some years ago there was no such possibility uh, we were always a little bit late vis-a-vis -vis those who started this information now we can we can really compete right we can really fight using uh ai but also with human beings so if you can just demonstrate us or give us an example how uh, how you do it yes of course i mean so so first of all the, the the first thing is actually catching up the narrative really early and finding out if the narrative is built up organically or if it is somehow created by some boosted boosted traffic or you know we mean inspired bots inspired example, bots and so on you know there there is a in in the internet we can see on average if, if we tackle some social topic currently if it's lgbt or if if it's pandemic and vaccines we see about 30 40 percent of artificial traffic that it is is involved really so you can see fake accounts you can check statistics of facebook you know you quarterly uh, Facebook uh, reports over one and a half billion of fake accounts. Quarterly, whereas one and a half billion, billion accounts, account. whereas the you know official number of regular users are two billions. So imagine proportions. And so there are mechanisms that create those fake accounts and they are boosting up some some things. And right now we can really see that these things are happening. And before they go to the level of the mass media reach, we can actually hijack this. So when you're talking about anti-disinformation systems, there is a sort of a technology that creates uh, or uh, serves as a, uh, as a radar, early detection radar. This is what we do, but you need to have a processes that really allow you to uh, really fast implement some sort of anti-disinformation strategy and it's really uh, based on a cooperation of you know uh, ngos um think, some tanks, yes. think tanks and so on technology would not solve all the issues and of course it must also work on the level of pr communication of you know of, of companies public institutions and so on so th this is what we need to learn together apart from the ai that of course is important is very important how to cooperate within the wider scope of different players to really, you know, do this kind of pushback when we know and observe this information. The question is how to react within 24 to 48 hours, because after this, it's going to be just too expensive to cope with. All right. So, so, so uh, many players need to be involved in this. So that's recommendation number one, and I want in the second round of the, now our discussion to go into the recommendations, especially to the public sector itself, to the politicians, to the government who meet uh, during this event IGF here in Katowice, uh, how to find this balance, right? So your recommendation would be, first of all, to cooperate. Uh, and it's not only that IT companies can do, them, can do it alone, and uh, they can't do it just to show the this service to the client it has to be also an analytical part qualitative quantitative analysis and also communication strategies to be able to find the right solution to the disinformation campaigns dalia if you can comment on that because you do this in the center for international relations with us but also with other um, uh, think tanks you had the experience uh, how would you uh, what could be your recommendation then i would um, i would dalia microphone um, 
there are more than one point uh, should uh, should be kept in mind when we are talking about countering uh, disinformation. One thing that any disinformation operation is an integral part of any influence uh, operation, any attack. So that can be to the infrastructure and this combined with the disinformation, it can be uh, it can be a cyber attacks, but it's always involves the content that is disinformation. Another thing is that disinformation is not a single action. So it is a systemic, it's a strategic communication for the malign purpose, goals. So it is systematic. Uh, the narratives are constructed by structures, architecture of different messages that are used and abused and, uh, and using our vulnerabilities of the society. So in other words, it could be like uh, other states playing with that. It could be also some companies vis-a-vis -vis other companies because who can harm. It depends on the goal. You might be manipulating, you might be persuading. Because what is communication is conveying certain information and expecting that your target group will, will, will behave according to the information that, uh, that receives and believes in it. So it's about uh, really fighting, uh, fighting for minds and hearts uh, of, uh, of the society. We say that we are in the state of war already. It's information war we are into and the Europe became really a battlefield of this. And of course, it's not all, all, only uh, necessarily the states involved, it could be also disinformation about Oops, our mindsets, different, right? Different players. Like anti-vaccine, it's a very Absolutely. good example. And uh, it's not necessarily everything is very purposeful. purposeful. Sometimes you do this kind of uh, circles of water, you know, you throw the stone and then you have uh, circles, rings of, uh, of waves going around and you even don't know how to predict it. But uh, what I wanted to say, if really we talk about countering disinformation, if we are always in a countering position, we will never win because it's a defensive position. Whether it is infrastructure, whether it is debunking things, these are tools. Content is a matter. So far, AI, as we see, is extremely important, but still we are living, uh, living beings and our brains is the value. So the content, our identity and our strategic communication our narratives, and we use this term positive narratives, that is, we have to know our story and believe in. And then, then what, uh, what uh, about technologies is excellent. Well, it's excellent when we talk in military terms, we have logistics. So in the digital world, we have information logistics because we see how different messages are flocked together and what kind be a signal. But again, you have to have the brains to know what to do with this, what for. So that's, uh, that's my recommendations. Uh, to so instead of always answer to the threats, to the narratives presented by somebody else, we Be should proactive. really produce you know, you have version. to lead the story. I would like to get back to Edward now because democracy is itself a, a, a question mark. There are some countries who say, you know, democracies during pandemic didn't deliver. Uh, democracies are not really systems. It's not a system adapted to 21st century challenges. So it's better to talk about good governance and bad governance instead of talking about democratic regimes and authoritarian regimes, for example. And you, you can imagine who says these kind of uh, things. So how we democracies could really um, uh, prove that we deliver and how Demtech, the thing you are uh, into, uh, this domain, technology in use of democracy, uh, help to prove that democracy can work? couple of questions now. Um, well, um, following on what you just said, Dalia, um, this um, defensive democracy, I completely agree. It's more of a uh, self-confident democracy that we need, a self-confident democracy where citizens and politicians and institutions together try new things to get ahead and not just to run behind completely. And when we talk about a self-confident democracy that tries new things, that is courageous and creative uh, in, the, in, in the political system, we need to educate political operatives, political professionals to um, being able to develop new technologies and to, uh, together with companies and to use these technologies. We have 
seen that. But you mean instance, what kind of one example? To, an example: uh, artificial intelligence, for instance. The legislative bodies in many countries do not know what kind of challenges they will face in the legislative process with artificial intelligence in, term, in all fields of policies in all fields. And so what, what we are at the Institute doing right now is for, for par parliaments, educating um, members of parliament to understand how they have to rethink the legislative process and what kind of um, technologies in the uh, field of artificial intelligence will change their work as, as members of parliament. And this is what we are doing. Are they in willing different to countries. really be educated? Are they willing to do Yes, they are. This? Yes, they, they are. are because open? there are many politicians who already understand that they are lagging behind with their knowledge and they know how and they desperately um, need and also accept the offer if, if, if given in the right way. So again, education will be the sector, you know, uh, when we discuss these things concerning democracy sooner or later, we always end up with education because it's obvious also because, you know, we cannot have democracy without really educated, prepared citizens. May I add, there is a gap in the political field because in the ministries and in the executive branch of government, there's a, already a huge know-how uh, assembled. There are, edu there are really experts there working on in these kinds of of, of fields, but in the legislative body, plus on the regional and local level, they most of these people um, elected by the citizens have um, certainly the need to get more information about how these technologies to use. So there's already two fields, a field that is very well educated and knowing what to do in the executive branch of governments and the rest in the political field. Okay, that will be the answer of somebody who deals with dem tech, meaning spreading out technology uh, into the democratic processes. We politicians, I am political scient scientists, but so political scientists and politicians try to change also a little bit democracy itself, because we feel that democracy has to also be adapted to new times, for example, not only to use uh, in many new ways technology, but maybe also to think about engaging more people. And, uh, you know, from technological point of view, um, uh, democracy could be direct today, could really engage everyone. But of course, not everyone is willing always to be asked about everything. So we need maybe new institutions, new processes. That's also another level we have to think about, not technological one. And uh, we say that technology is not necessarily guarantees more democracy. So again, <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's why I wanted to share with you our, um, our recommendation. We, uh, as a Center for International Relations, we are uh, operator in Poland and Baltic countries with Dalia. Uh, uh, of a project uh, called Everyone, which is a new in, uh, initiative uh, born, by the way, in, in, uh, in Vienna and in Germany as well, to spread out the, the idea to uh, add to existing charter of human rights, which is a part of our Lisbon Treaty in the European Union. Uh, so it's um, a charter of human rights of the EU right now. Um, enlarge it, add new articles, new rights and of course it's very much uh, it's in it's connected with 21st century because most of these new articles concerns internet uh, and right for example of people to decide what kind of knowledge about themselves will last in the internet and what will be deleted by them as owners of this information so this will be the right for uh, let's say decisions uh, about our own profile in the internet. Or another article, it will be, it's a very interesting one. I would be very curious how you react on that. The right to uh, be said the truth by the politicians, by those who uh, are on the top and are paid by public uh, money from public budget, from you know our own uh, people's money, let's say, because the state doesn't have any money, as you know, it's our money, citizens' money. So the right to expect that these people, presidents, prime ministers, ministers, tell us truth. If not, they could be persecuted for, you know, misleading us, those disinforming. So that's, of course, an open question, and we uh, will be very happy to discuss it further, but this could be one of the uh, answers to the challenges we see. 
uh, Yaroslav, to you, the question could, uh, would be a little bit similar, but maybe from the other point of view. Also, you serve the public sector very often. So, and you also have to implement technologies which not necessarily uh, are always you know, understood. And you have to also protect the clients. Uh, what would be your recommendation from your point of view to be able to you know, obtain both the contracts and also the protection of the clients? Right. I mean, I, I fully agree what uh, what was said before. I mean that this education is is really important because if we take into consideration the whole cybersecurity world, the weakest elements are people. Because we could have very sophisticated from technology point of view systems, but if I will put on a parking lot USB stick with the malware or any virus and somebody is not enough educated and, and he or she did not put into the corporate computer, no, nobody helps. So what, um, and the second thing I fully agree is that the speed of technology development is much, much faster than the legislation. So that's why what we are trying to, um, how we are trying to convince the customers is always to use the state of the art or somebody saying the best practices. It means that we cannot find what to do in the legislation, but we can find it in, for example, some norms or the best practices, like the ISO 27K from the cybersecurity point of view, or from the industrial point of view, the IEC 62443. So that's why we are together with the customers are trying to go through the whole process to, on one hand, to educate them and to show them. The second thing is what we are doing internally. I mean, all the process, internal process in the Siemens is, um, we call it from the marketing point of view, the cybersecurity in design. So what we are trying to do is to, from the starting from design step to prepare our product and solution that are the most secure. Of course, not 100%, it's not possible, but this is what we- But in do. your opinion, is it possible to really secure, you know, a critical infrastructure such as energy, for example, which is absolutely key today because we don't need any conventional war. We don't need, let's take an example of Russian army at, uh, invading Ukraine. That's what we are discussing in the Polish media right now and in the European media as well. Russia doesn't need to do that. If they are so good in cyber attacks, they could you know, harm us by, for example, um, switching off the power. Well, that's why, based on my experience, even in Poland, uh, the, the, the awareness level is, is, is really high. And what the the customers from the critical infrastructure expecting from the Siemens is that we will implement some best practices like ISO 27K or others. So if we are providing to them our products or services, they expect that we are doing this job based on the best state of the art processes, procedures whatsoever. So in other words, you can say that that's absolutely necessarily element if we want to really implement uh, sophisticated new technologies in the infrastructure, which is critical, without really securing uh, that they are safe, that they, that they they can really trust, that they can really operate uh, and be connected uh, to, for example, internet. It's not dangerous. It will not be developed this way, right? Yes, of course. I mean. It, frankly speaking, the digitalization, more and more devices or people connected to the network, it means more risk on the cybersecurity side. Exactly. That means that, you know, this connection will be the best, <laughs> the best way, but that doesn't resolve the problem neither. We have a third, uh, first question, I think, in yeah. the audience. If you can just introduce yourself. And I encourage very much all the participants to, to, to add to the discussion and with questions or comments, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alke Pals from the Netherlands, working as consultant AI with KPMG. Um, and I was triggered with the argument of uh, the weakest link 
in cybersecurity would be the human, but uh, relationships and people and how we act in life is based on trust as well. So we also need to tend to trust uh, the other side. For instance, today in my goodie bag, I received a power bank, a power bank with a USB cable. Even um, to all the participants to this IGF summit, yes. Yeah, and uh, now I have to make a distinction. Okay, it's Poland. Hmm. Okay, is that is that total secure? Um, I come from Netherlands. Um, th that's one consideration. The second, What's wrong with Poland? Uh, <laughs> They're still in the European Union. Uh, um, in democracy, we can have a whole other discussion about that, but let's uh, keep, keep on topic. Um, I think our government is on this. I'm not <laughs> making this discussion right now. Um, but I trust you. Okay. Um, but we received this. And I have to make a distinction according uh, to you and also according to my own knowledge, because I think that I am uh, educated enough to make a distinction. Um, on if we trust, for instance, now this device, but on the other hand, if a company provides me with a USB stick, uh, for instance, my own company, I must hope it's safe. But I don't know if at the IT department or maybe before at uh, uh, the parcel, uh, parcel guy or girl who delivered that to the company has already um, put in some malware or ransomware into the USB stick. It's all about trust in this. And, but education, I totally agree with that. Education is key in this. But it's a balance, and I just wanted to stress that, and maybe uh, we can start a debate about that as well. Um, but it's, it's about trust. But on the other hand, I worked at another company, <laughs> um, and they had a whole a folder infrastructure public for all employees. So me as a curious uh, employee of the company, just clicking through all the folders, reading everything. Um, and then on, on one moment, our approach, oh, you're not allowed to see this kind of information. But I said, okay, it's public. I can see it. I'm an employee. I hope we trust each other. Um, and that triggered also a conversation within the company. But my point was um, trust and education I think it's a balance. And, thank you. Thank uh, you for, for this comment, because I think it's a very important thing he raised. Actually, first thing, what we did, uh, you know, I, I am Polish, so I have no problem, you know, being here. But I checked who produced this power bank. We checked that because the producer can also be an issue if we don't trust all the producers of such devices, right, without naming them. Uh, okay, somebody wants to comment on the comment? Yaroslav, well, I, I mean, for, first of all, I fully agree with you that we should trust each other. And I, I was not talking about, let's say, trusting between the employees. However, you probably know that sometimes it could happen that we have angry employee who is leaving company and he want to make some damage to this company because he didn't agree that he was fired or something like this. I was When I was telling about the weakest point of the human being, I was thinking about the criminals who are using, for example, the social engineering to convince us to take the stick and to put to the company computer, rather than your friend from the next desk will give you, hey, I have a new movie, so just check it. Yeah, but I could possibly trust my colleague sitting next to me, but maybe, um, yeah, he's the weakest link in this. Can be. Yeah. So that's why, for example, in the, let's say, even in Siemens, in some departments who are taking care about the cybersecurity, every computer does not have a USB port. So you cannot copy uh, company documents or company files and take them with you outside the office. But he's also right, you know, because during pandemic, uh, we still are having pandemic and online is so natural. And we've discovered that in many public institutions, because of the protection, um, we couldn't really connect. Certain, you know, tools were not allowed uh, because the laptops were protected. So the human element would be that to avoid this problem and to be able to connect uh, the 
the people were using private equipment. They were using private laptops. They were using smartphones. So it's it's very in much about your comment. It's well, we have to trust each other, but there are also some levels of protections which could not be too high because otherwise we cannot really work. We cannot really be. Digital. I mean, the most critical is that always what, for example, we are doing at Siemens is always to make the risk assessment. So, for example, if the company will allow you to look at every file on the servers, so if this is not a critical for them, if the information will be made public, that's totally fine. That's, but make if, a note, this was my former employee. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but if, for example, at Siemens, we are producing a blade of the gas turbine and the precision can be one uh, zero dot zero 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 one millimeter and some criminals will change technical files and the, the, the dimension will be one single millimeter bigger then it could cost people's lives because this gas turbine will damage infrastructure and sometimes can kill the people. Mm -hmm. So that's why we always think about each single piece of information from three points of view. Confidentiality, does it mean if I will release something wrong happen? Integrity, if someone will change something within. And last is availability. If I lose this information, am I still able to continue my business or not? That's also a good recommendation. The Bromir, then, and we have one more uh, question or comment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, I'd like to comment. Can... I'd like to comment. I love your comment, uh, you, you know, because you, you just tackled this idea of trust and you ask a question, can I trust this country that I'm coming to? Can I trust the company that is producing something? Can I trust my colleagues? And so on and so on. And there is this very wide term of digital trust as a framework. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's one of the elements that, that provide a lot of, you know, recommendations to how we should really act right now in, in, in this technological reality. Because, you know, we are very much in love in innovations. And most of the innovations are just acquired and, and implement it. And not so many, I think companies do this balance uh, of, of, of or just balance testing, asking a question, you know, whether it's not only good for the uh, profitability uh, short term, or is it good what's, you know, in the long term for the humanity. So this is one thing. And I'm, I'm, coming, I'm coming to the point where we started talking about this information but the real problem of this information is actually a business model of the media, you know, because no one is really interested in getting rid of bots and trolls and all that stuff we don't trust because it works to the profitability of the social media, of the media itself, and so on. You know, you have a situation where the digital advertising market uh, rises every year, double digit, like 20, 20 something percent. And if you look at the inventory that is available to the consumers, it's not really, it's not possible that it's growing because the population is stable, number of mobile phones is stable and so on and so on. And only due to the fact that there is this growth factor that, you know, all the players want to be part of, they're interested in keeping all this false, you know, all this false um, uh, traffic to their advantage. and. This is where digital trust is sort of have boundaries, right? So we could say, we don't really trust these media because their algorithms not serve our public, let's say interest, but they serve, it only serves themselves, you know, as, a, as an income process. So it, it's, it's exactly the same, you know, we can of course discuss big corporations. We had a lot of examples from the corporate sector, you know, including let's say, uh, Volkswagen, you know, they were cheating on emissions, for instance, like for their cars and so on, because they had short term, you know, um, uh, interest in, in, in providing something that would, you know, result as an, in, in, a prof in a profitable business. But, but uh, uh, 
this is this is uh, something I would use as a very strong um, uh, recommendation to really implement digital trust framework. So require from every company and from every player on the market to really build a transparent framework for building this balance test. So we know that there is a Facebook. We know that there is this short-term interest in building revenue, but Facebook should provide, for instance, meta, so, no. some, some, or meta, or meta, right, so, should provide some, some, some information how the algorithm works and then do some balance testing or whether it's, of course, it's good for the company or on the other hand, does it really provide something good for the for the society, okay. right? Or, let's yeah. put the dot here because otherwise we'll not have time for another comment. Please and, just let's stop here because we have another gentleman who is willing to, to comment as yeah. well, okay? Uh, if I were sitting on the other side, I would also indeed encourage you to uh, make an impact assessment on all stakeholders involved. So the company, uh, the public, and if you do that in a multi-stakeholder uh, way, then you can uh, see if an AI system uh, uh -huh. could be harmed or not. Thank you. Thank you for this recommendation. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, is it working? Okay. So my name is Asim Adil and uh, I'm an IT consultant. I come from Pakistan, but uh, I worked uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, right now I'm based in Germany. My concern about all this talk topic was uh, we started talking about AI and its uh, misinformation and miscommunication, all those aspects. Uh, we know data vulnerabilities, uh, then we move to cybersecurity and threats. But the most important is uh, how we bring the strategies, particularly from the policymakers' point of view, as you raised about the human rights, so uh, I coined a term a few days ago, digital human rights. So might be, that would be the right caption for you. And it is not about digital human rights. It is also about that, how we create the awareness. And for example, I can drive a car and, but everyone cannot drive a car. So everyone does not want to drive a car. So, but still they can use a car just like we are using internet, but we are not aware about that, how the cookies are behaving with it, how the information is getting in our newsfeed. So that all information filtration process for every human is not easy. The legislation, as you mentioned, pre-Bible, there, there is a, a whole uh, history there that we always had the ways of making laws. We were making laws either on the basis of religion or the culture or the basis of need. So now this is the time to make the digital laws and implement them, no matter if it is a governance uh, uh, on the democratic basis or a regime basis, but still there should be the legislations which should be enforced or dictated with following the standardization and then awareness should be created for the common purpose. Thank you for That's that, because it's exactly what we, it's happening in the European Union and in the Western world, definitely, you know, Especially you're trying GDPR. to- Yes, uh, but maybe, you know, Edward and Dahlia, please, uh, if you want to react on this comment. Uh, short answer is yes, <laughs> it's a reaction. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm fully on your side and I'm saying yes. On the other hand, the reality is as we know, internet happened to us. It's running before, uh, before in front, uh, before and we're chasing. So the legal basis or the rules that should be agreed and that we agree upon the rules, how we are going to navigate and behave and be accountable uh, for, for the digital world, this is now in the process. For example, there's a good practice uh, uh, code initiated by the commission together with social platforms, with media uh, companies. Uh, it's absolutely clear, it's a good, it's a nice uh, step forward, but it is not enough. It didn't work. It does not really. You cannot rely. So the the code, uh, the code book or legal basis are under under the drafting. It's extremely it's extremely uh, demanding. 
more important, I would say, when I hear about infrastructure, Siemens infrastructure examples, I immediately think about the energy sector infrastructure. And uh, this is, again, trust is extremely important, rules and agreements as well, and agree upon the what, what world we live. If it is a democratic world, it is based on trust, about, on the transparency and accountability. That is certain moral values or moral campus. It's not a naive talk. Otherwise, we get, get lost. So it's important, really, the member states trust to each other. Within the companies, yes, it's extremely important, but at the same time, this is to do a lot with the intelligence, with our national securities that unfortunately even allies do not like to share. But I understand his point was also that even if we trust, the certain rules of the games have to be play, put, like the same way with cars, you gave the example of cars, we have to have rules in the internet how to drive, let's say, how to, uh, for the internauts, how to, you know, exist in this space. And if you want to know more about that, the Center for International Relations has a project called starttothink.info. And we propose certain code, like the roads, you know, the, 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 the code of science for the roads was implemented one day. So now we propose the code for the internet, for the internauts to be able to browse um, uh, among all these sites in the internet uh, to stress what is really important to remember, right? Uh, one more question to Edward, maybe he wants to react and then I will get back to you. Repeat the question to me. No, no, it was a reaction. No, I'm responding positively to what you said. I really agree. Thank you very much. I, I would just like to add a little bit here. Uh, just like the technology is agile and it is evolving every day, if we just keep thinking in the uh, way of legislation as it used to be, it will never work. We have to also come up with a solution with the agile legislation, maybe an AI based legislation, which will evolve as the evolvement of the technology continuously. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for this comment. Uh, we have another comment. Uh, yes, please. Julia Kozak, I'm from the Center uh, of International Relations. I just wanted to refer to what we said about the legislations and you mentioned the project of everyone. And this is exactly about that. And just wanted to uh, tell you the article uh, about the artificial uh, intelligence. And it says, everyone has the right to know that any algorithms imposed on them are transparent, verifiable and fair. And the major decision must be taken by the human beings. So uh, this is exactly related so, to the... Yeah, this is very much about, you know, that, that at the end of the day, even if we use algorithms, even if we use AI, it can't be that the AI decide. The decision has to be given to the humans and the AI has to be treated as a tool, right? As an instrument uh, in order to, you know, help us not to, uh, in one day, you know, to, to, to take control over us. Uh, Dobromir, you want to, you disagree? Yeah, you know, I, I have a little doubts about the, um, you know, this capability of, 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 of humans in terms of making conscious decisions on whether, because, you know, as you look on the, on the perspective of using, let's say, social media, social media say, but listen, you, you had everything written down in our regulations, it confirms how your data will be processed. And after you know, a couple of years, people woke up in this strange reality, you know, thinking about how and why this model provided this kind of um, um, this kind of um, results, you know, looking at disinformation, looking at tensions between different groups. So, so what would be your recommendation then? I'm, I, I'm not sure if I would really, uh, I, I understand that people should be informed and I, I understand, I, I believe in a transparency in terms of access to information, whether we, were, we are contacted by, you know, another human or AI and, and so on and so on. But I really believe in this world, I don't believe that average human average consumer will ever understand technology. It's, it's, it's beyond comprehension. So I believe more in a role of public institutions, to be honest. 
this is this is what I think. The public institutions are actually securing consumers who are unable to do conscious decisions about themselves. This is unfortunately, this is, you know, in, in many areas of our lives, starting from technology, maybe ending on, I don't know, medical treatments, we're not able to make decisions for ourselves as a consumers. But maybe it's not about, you know, knowing every single detail of new technologies. Maybe it's like with the cars, the example was given that we don't need to repair the car. We don't need even to know what is inside the engine, but we have to know where we are going. And we have to know what are the rules of the roads we are driving upon, right? So in the internet still, everything is on open. We have one more comment that's last one because we are already over the time. Please introduce yourself. Yes, so my name is Xavier Brandao. So I work for I Am Here International, hashtag I Am Here. So what we do is we fight uh, uh, disinformation, misinformation online and hate speech. Uh, so we are the human factor, so to say. Uh, we believe uh, AI is great, it's fantastic, but it's far from being enough. And we think we should be careful about techno optimism because in the coming years or decades, probably we'll still need humans uh, to fight misinformation. And what we see most of the time on common sections, because we go in common sections uh, to, to counter uh, hate speech and misinformation, we see that it's um, people who uh, are sharing it on um, good faith. So they believe in it, actually. So the, we think the human factor is really important because we need to be talking to these people, you know, uh, human to human, and, and they expect human to talk to them uh, and, and, you know, fellow citizens. So I, I wanted to highlight this important aspect. Thank you. It's very important. And then my, uh, my final comment will be that what we've, uh, you know, discussed here, of course, we'll discuss many more times because we are at the beginning of this process of finding the right approach to new, new technologies, because I think we are overcoming already this phase that we were super enthusiastic. We are now very realistic and we want to use new technologies, definitely, because they make our life easier. Uh, but in the same time, we have to find the right ways to control them and control maybe ourselves in this world uh, full of new technologies everywhere. Thank you for this discussion. Uh, let me just once again say Dalia Bankauskaitia, thank you very much. Vilnius, Lithuania, Jarosław uh, Pacewicz, Siemens, Poland, uh, Dobromir Cias, Polska, Edge and Edward Strasser, Austria, Vienna Institute, uh, Innovations and Politics Institute. My pleasure. Thank you all for watching.